Hello, everyone. Hello, friends. Hello. Hello. How are you? Yeah. Me too. Hi. Yes. Can we give one more round of applause? Welcome to Pittsburgh Public Theater's showcase of finalists for our 28th annual Shakespeare Monologue and Scene Competition. My name is Mariah C. Kaminsky. I serve as artistic director here at the Public Theater, and this year we engaged over 70 schools and hundreds of students before inviting these extraordinary young artists to grace our stage tonight. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold our swelling scene. Earlier this weekend, you may have seen Pittsburgh performer and phenomenon Shaman McCune speak those words in this very theater. In a small, a short film uh, created by Damon Palmer of the Empty Space Project for our Shakespeare Festival this year. And I just wanted to conjure this again. Oh yeah, did I hear snaps? Because that was amazing. If anybody saw that, please look it up when you get home. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring it up because when Shalman spoke those words just a few weeks ago in this theater, the house was empty, the stage was dark, like it has been for too many months over the last two years. And I cannot tell you how good it feels to have these young people here tonight raising their voices and their talents to the rafters and to be able to continue the legacy of this competition that has been, that has served as a muse of fire for generations of students. Thank you for being a part of that. Thank you for being here tonight and thank all of you. If you will indulge me, we actually have so many people to thank. Um, our staff and crew and board who are working behind the scenes tonight and all year round to make this possible. Yes, thank you. Our relentlessly talented teaching artists and coaches, some of whom are with us tonight, who have been journeying with these students. tonight was to be or not to be. Thank you. I also want to thank you parents, families, classroom teachers. Uh, the last couple of years have not been easy for any of us and the way that you steward these young people uh, through this experience but through the every day of their education and their growing up and cultivating their talents. Uh, I'm moved by it. Thank you for what you do. And last but not least, I do want to thank the generous sponsors that make these education programs available for uh, schools and students across Western Pennsylvania. I memorized them before I got up here, but it's going to take me a minute. Hold on. Oh, damn. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, of course. The Grable Foundation, the BN BNY Mellon Foundation, the Jack Boonshire Foundation, and McKinney Charitable Foundation as part of PNC Charitable Trust. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on in, friends. Uh, last but not least, I am very excited to introduce you to someone who is an enormous champion for the public theater and an enormous champion for arts and education and the title sponsor for tonight's event, Dr. Richard Moriarty, who some of you may know as the original Mr. Yuck. <laughs> You notice the resemblance, okay. Um, 
That's why I wear my mask all the time. I was wearing it even before the pandemic came along. <laughs> Thank you, Mariah. Um, you know, while, while, the, while this program is uh, celebrating its 28th year, I first attended one of these contests only six years ago. And I was absolutely blown away by what these young kids do. And I thought, I recognize that not all the participants are going to wind up being actors, but the knowledge and the skills that you participants have learned will help you for the rest of your life. And that's why I decided to invest in this program. I've supported the program for a couple of years now, and I will continue to do so. As evidence of that promise, Mariah, here's my check. <laughs> It's for $30,000. I can't take it with me, and that's why I'm investing it in you guys, okay? <laughs> so this is to help support next year's program, and Hopefully other people will pitch in too. Enjoy tonight. I know I will. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and thanks for coming. Dr. Moriarty, thank you so much. I'm going to try not to lose this. Um, and now, without further ado, I am excited to introduce you to the man that made tonight all happen. Uh, our host with the most, the illustrious Director of Education and Engagement, Parag Shanti Goa. Hi, everybody! <laughs> My name is Parag Shanti Goa. I'm the Director of Education and Engagement, and I am the one who has been sending you all of those emails. In person, this is not a simulation. Can we just take a moment to look around at this gorgeous space? Look around at each other. We're here. This is incredible. Show of hands, uh, who was in the O'Reilly Theater for the first time ever? Yeah! Welcome to the Oscar And who is coming back to the O'Reilly Theater? Aw, yeah! Whose first time is it uh, for the uh, what is this? The Shakespeare Monologue and Scene Contest. Very awesome. Welcome, welcome. Um, and who's returning to this contest with us tonight? Amazing. Round of applause for everybody. This would not be possible without you. And it is so wonderful that you made it here. And we're so happy that our folks from home are streaming as well. Hello, a round of applause for them. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge um, that yes, we are here. Uh, we're also on the ground um, uh, that is home to the Seneca people. Uh, they call this area Juan de Ogen between two rivers, the crossroads of the Seneca, Lenny Lenape, Shawnee, and numerous nations who lived before, with and after them. We acknowledge this land and their continued spiritual connection to it as sacred. Through awareness and action, we can honor that spiritual connection and combat continued marginalization. Please join us and visit our website for more information on our full statement. What a journey to this moment. So it started around five months ago as registration opened for this contest. It feels like a lifetime ago. Hundreds of participants entered this contest thanks to the wonderful educators, school partners, and parents and families who signed them up. 
They've received coaching workshops from over a dozen incredible teaching artists uh, for their video submissions, um, who also comprised our panel of prelim judges. And they also gave us the very tough job of narrowing it down to our finalists, who we are so proud to host on this stage tonight. Let's give them a huge round of applause. And congratulations to all of our participants who entered this contest this year. Speaking of the contests, 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 contests between lower and upper division, our finalists will be judged on the following. Understanding of the text and character, emotional connection, physical presentation, and vocal presentation. Winners will be named in both lower and upper division for best scene and best monologue. The tremendous job of judging and scoring these finalists uh, uh, tonight, uh, it falls on the shoulders of three individuals who I'm gonna introduce right now. Uh, first, Jamie Agnello. Who uh, most recently appeared as Trinculo here at the Public in the Tempest. Shaman McCune. Who you hopefully saw uh, invoke that music fire uh, in the empty space collaboration, uh, but also played Caliban in the Tempest. And Ricardo Villarraher. Who appeared in uh, the public production of Indecent and is a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh. Tonight, you'll also see the wonderful collaboration between lower and upper divisions, facilitated by teaching artists Alex Manalo and Hope Anthony from our first ever Shakespeare Festival. So for its inaugural launch this year, uh, it was a 10-day countdown full of virtual and in-person offerings to show all the ways that Shakespeare can look, and it was meant to provide new pathways for exploration through elements of design and devised performance. Essentially, to use Shakespeare as a starting point and catalyst for imagination and self-expression. An enormous thank you to the teaching artists who contributed to that, and to Karina, Asia, and the marketing team for making that happen and look, make us look so great online. Um, you can still explore those offerings on our Pittsburgh Public Theater Shakespeare Monologue and Scene Contest Facebook page. If you don't already like or follow that, get on that! And uh, this, that's where the event is also being live streamed tonight. I also want to give an enormous thank you to this year's Shakespeare Contest Associate, Jenny Malarkey. Yes! I'm sure she's running around backstage somewhere uh, with the help of Oh no, she's right there! In my mind, you're always running around, yes. Uh, without whom this contest would not have been possible. And to Mariah C. Kaminsky, for encouraging all of us to dream big. Now, because we don't often get a chance to do this, and this is so rare, will you all indulge me for a moment? Will you repeat after me? Oh, for a muse of fire. Oh, for a muse of fire. That was pretty good. Let's try again. I'll say it, you say it back. Oh, for a muse of fire. Oh, for a muse of fire. Let's try one more time. Ready? This is a secret warm up. You ready? Okay. Oh, for a muse of fire. Oh, for a muse of fire. Yes, all right. These finalists have brought the fire. And now, without further ado, I present to you the 2022 Shakespeare Monologue and Scene Contest, starting with our showcase of lower division. And I invite the first group to take the stage. Mom. 
Hello, my name is Toshe Adelimi, and I'm in sixth grade. Today, we will be performing Act One, Scene Two, and A Midsummer's Night Dream. Today, I will be portraying Nick Bottom. Hello, my name is Carson D'Antonio. I am playing Peter Quince from Midsummer Night's Dream, Act One, Scene Two. Hello, I'm Unika Huda, and today I will be portraying Francis Fluke of A Midsummer's Night Dream, Act One, Scene Two. Is all our company here? You are best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. Here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought to fit through all Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and the most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work. I assure you. And a man. Now good, Peter Quinns. Call forth your actors by the scroll. Masters, spread yourselves. Answer as I call. Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready? Name what part I am for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? It is a lover that kills himself most gallant for love. That will last some tears in the true performing of it. If... I do it. Let the audience look into their eyes. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. To the rest, yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Hercules rarely, or a heart to tear a cat in to make all split. The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phoebus's car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fate. This was lofty. Now name the rest of the players. Is this Hercules' vein? A tyrant's vein? A lover's more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender? Here, Peter Quince. Flute, you must take 
this be on you? What is this be? A wandering knight? It is a lady that Pyramus must love. Nay, faith. I may not play a woman. I, I have a beard coming. That's all one. You shall play in a mat. You may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Fisbee too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Fizzney, Fizzney. <coughs> Hi, my name is Arjun Puri. I'm a seventh grader at Carson Middle School, uh, and we will be performing King Lear. I am King Lear. Hi, my name is Ellie Pang, and I'm a seventh grader at Carson Middle, and I will be playing Cardelia. Now our joy, although last not least, to his young love, the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interested. What can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Unhappy that I am. I cannot see my heart in my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, nor more nor less. How, how Cordelia, mend your speech a little, lest it may more in your fortunes. Good, my lord. You've begot me, bred me, loved me. I return this duty's back as right fit. I bear you, love you, and most honor you. Why have my sisters' husbands if they say they love you? How can when I do what that Lord whose hand must take my place shall carry half my love with them? Have my care and duty. Surely I should never marry like my sisters to love my brother all. He goes thy heart with this? Aye, good my lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. That it be so a truth then be thy dower, for by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate and the night, by all the operation of the orbs from whom we do exist and cease to be, here I disclaim all thy paternal care, for proper quiddity and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart, hold me for this forever. By the mysteries of Hecate and the night, the radiation of the sun and orbs, the operation of all the orbs from whom we do exist, and I all, uh, and as a stranger to my heart, hold thee from this forever. The barbarous Scythian or he that makes his generation messes to guard his appetite shall to be as well neighbored, bosomed, and relieved as thou, my sometime daughter. Thank you. Thank you.
divine. What shall I compare my love, thine eyne? Crystal is muddy, oh, how ripe and show. Lips like kissing cherries, tempting grow. The pure congealed white high towards snow. Fanned with the eastern wind turns to a crow. When thy host is up thy hand, well, let me kiss the swims of pure white, the seal of bliss. Oh, spite! Oh, heaven! I see your old bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil in your courtesy, you would not do me thus much injury. Can you not hate me, as I know you do, but you must join in souls to mock me, too? If you were men, as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so, to vow and swear and superpraise my parts, when I'm sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia, and now both rivals to mock Helena, a trim exploit, a manly enterprise, to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes, with your derision, none of noble sort, would so offend a virgin and extort a poor soul's patience all to be spoiled. <laughs> Be not so, for you love Hermia, this you know I know, and here, with all good will, with all my heart, and Hermia's love, I you dropped my part, and yours, of Helena, to me bequeath. Keep thy Hermia, I will none. If I were I loved her, all that love is gone. My heart to us just white sojourned. Helen is home returned, there to remain. Helen, it is not so. Disparge not the faith thou dost not know, lest of thy peril thou abbey it dear. Look where thy love comes, yonder is thy dear. Dark night, that from the eye his function take, the ear more quick of apprehension makes, wherein it doth impair the seeing sense, it pays the hearing double recompense. Thou art not by mine eye, my dead of mine, my ear, I think it, brought me to thy snap. But why untimely didst thou leave me so? Why should he say when love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love that would not let him fight. Fair Helena, who more engilds the night than all yon fiery oaks and eyes of light. Why seek thou me? Could this not make thee know the hate I bear thee made me leave thee so? You speak not as you think. There cannot be. and we're from Grand Elementary. Hi, my name is Lightning Keith, and today me and my friend Claire are going to be doing a very good winter at the school. I will be portraying Mr. Sport and I will be portraying Mr. Page. Let us begin. Mr. 
Here's the twin brothers I left, who had dying hair to describe to us by themselves. I more he had been down in those letters, where it was blank space, a sore more than his own respected position. He will print them out himself, and he cares not what he puts into the pressure of the letters to. I'd rather be a giant than I know how to tell him, while I'll find you, pointing a serious turn of my one chance man. And why? My feet are so hard to marry Satan. The very hand, the very words. What do you think of us? Nay, I know not. It makes me almost ready to rest in the bars of all people. I want to chain myself like I am one that can not afraid to fall. For sure, unless he has restrained me, he would never afford me in his fury. Poor Nicodemus. <laughs> I wish you'd be him of So I think I'm going to my conscience. I'm never to see again. Let's be revenged by him. Let's appoint him immediately. Give him a show of comfort and his own suit, and make him on with a fine lady of the land. So he hath caught his horses to my post of the barter? Nay, who would have any villainy against me that may not so be kept from? Oh, that my husband saw a letter. It would be a terrible case if he did not me. But look. Where he comes now, and my good man too. He's as far as from jealousy as I am from giving him cause, and that I hope he's an unmeasurable distance. You are the happier one. Let's consult together against this great tonight. Come hither. Thank you. but you may refer to me as Cosmo. And today, I am King Oberon from A Midsummer's Night Dream. Thank you for your time. to pity for meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors from this hateful fool. I did upbraid her and fall out with her, for she his hairy temples then had rounded with a coronet of fresh and fragrant flowers. And that same dew, which sometime on the bud, was wont to swell like round and orient pearls. So now within the pretty flower its eyes, like tears that did their own disgrace bewail. When I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild turn begged my patience, I then did ask her, her changeling child, which straight she gave me, and sent her fairy to bear him to my bower and fairyland. And now I have the boy. I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. And gentle Puck, take the transformed scout from off the head of this Athenian swain, that he, awaking when the other do, may all to Athens back again repair, and think no more of this night's obstinance, but as the fierce vexation of a dream. But first, I will release the fairy queen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mai Aronson, and <laughs> hello, I'm Mai Aronson, and I'm from the Environmental Charter School in fourth grade. Today I will be playing Jay Quees from the Seven Ages of Man speech, As You Like It, Act 2, Scene 7.
stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewing and puking in the nurse's arms. And then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail and willingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. Then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard. Jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. Then the justice in fair round belly with good capon line, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The six age shifts into lean in the slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side. For his youthful hose, well saved, a world too wide. For his shrink shank and big manly voice, turning again toward childish treble pipes and whistles in his side. The last scene of all that ends the strange, eventful history in second childishness and mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eye, sans taste, sans everything. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ethan Dyrood, and today I will be Petruchio Act four, scene one, from The Taming of the Shrew. <laughs> Thus have I politically begun my reign, and tis my hope to end successfully. My falcon now is sharp and passing empty, and till she stoop, she must not be full gorged, for then she never looks upon her lure. Another way I have to man my haggard, to make her come and know her keeper's call. That is, to watch her as we watch these kites that bait and beat and will not be obedient. She ate no meat today, nor none shall eat. Last night she slept not, nor tonight she shall not. As with the meat some undeserved fault I'll find about the making of the bed. And here I'll fling the pillow, there the bolster, this way the sheets and another way the coverlet. And I, amid this hurly, I intend that all is done in reverend care of her. And in conclusion, she shall watch all night. And if she chance to nod, or rail and brawl, and with the clamor keep her still awake. This is a way to kill a wife with kindness. He that knows better how to tame a shrew, let him speak, and his charity to show. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lillian Mocker, and I am from Environmental Charter School, and I am in fourth grade, and today I am Phoebe from As You Like It, Act 3, Scene 5. I will not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tellest me there is murder in mine eye. Tis pretty sure and very probable that eyes that are the frailest and softest things, who shut their coward gates on atomies, should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart, so if my eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. <laughs> <laughs> now
not count if it too swoon, why now fall down? Or if thou canst not, oh, for shame, for shame, lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Now show the wound my, mine eye hath made in thee, scratch thee with pin, and there remains some scar of it. Lean but upon rush, the cicatrice incapable and pressure thy palm some moment keeps. But now mine eyes, which have darted at thee, hurt thee not, nor I'm sure there's no force in eyes that can do hurt. Thank you. Hello, my name's Jude Glover and I'm a fifth grader from McMurray Elementary. Uh, today I'm playing Mark Antony from Julius Caesar, Act 3, Scene 1. man, whoever lived in the tide of times. <laughs> Woe to the hand that shed this costly blood. Over thy wounds now do I prophesy, which like dumb mouths do open their ruby lips, the beg the voice and utterance of my tongue. A curse shall light upon the limbs of men. Domestic fury and fierce self strife shall cumber all the parts of Italy. Blood destruction shall be so in use, and dreadful objects so familiar, that mothers shall but smile when they behold their infants cornered with the hands of war. Oh, pity choked with the custom of fell deeds, and Caesar's spirit raging for revenge, with Ote by his side, come hot from hell, shall in these confines with a monarch's voice cry havoc, and that slip the dogs of war. With this foul deed shall smell above the earth, with carrion men groaning for burial. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ajua Oloku Dakwa, and I will be playing Calpurnia from Julius Caesar, Act Two. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies, yet now they fright me. There is one within, besides the things that we have heard and seen, recounts most horrid sights seen by the watch. A lioness hath whelped in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fight upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons and ripe form of war, which drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurtled in the air. Horses did neigh, and dying men did groan, and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets. Oh, Caesar, these things are beyond all use, and I do fear them. When beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes. Thank you. Shakespeare contest first, for the first time ever, and thanks in part to our Shakespeare Festival offerings, you are going to see uh, all lower division participants from scenes and monologue uh, work together to express an interpretation of love, power, betrayal, and magic. Enjoy.
for Upper St. Clair High School. And today we will be performing an excerpt from The Merry Wives of Windsor, Act 4, Scene 2. My name is Ishan Sharma, and I am playing Falstaff. My name is Armin Pettit, and I'll be playing Mistress Four. And my name is Opal Miller, and I will be playing Mistress Page. <laughs> Mistress Four, your sorrow hath eaten up my suffering. 
and I see you are obsequious in your love. And I profess requital to a hair's breadth, not only mistress war, in the simple <laughs> office of love, but in all the accoutrement, compliment, and ceremony of it. But are you sure of your husband now? He's a burning sweet Sir John. <laughs> what ho! Gossip forward! What ho! Step into the chamber, Sir John. How now, sweetheart? Who's at home beside yourself? Why, none but mine own people. Indeed. <laughs> no, certainly. Speak louder. Truly, I am so glad you have nobody here. Why? Why, woman, your husband is in his old wounds again. He so takes on yonder with my husband, so rails against all married mankind, so curses all these daughters of any complexion soever, and so buffets himself on the forehead, crying, peer out, peer out, that any madness I ever yet beheld seem but tameness, civility, and patience. To this his distemper he is in now. I am glad the fat knight is not here. Why does he speak of him? Of none but him, and swears he was carried out the last time he was here in a basket, and protests to my husband that he is here now, and hath drawn him and the rest of their company away from their sport to make another experiment of his suspicions. But I am glad the fat knight is not here. Now he shall see his own foolery. How near is he, Mistress Page? Oh, hard by at street end. He will be here anon. <clears throat> I am undone. The fat knight is here. Why, woman, you are utterly shamed, and he's but a dead man. <laughs> away with him, away with him. Better shame than murder. Uh, which way should he go? How shall I bestow him? Shall I put him into the basket again? No! I'll come no more in the basket. May I not go out ere he come? Alas, three of Master Ford's brothers watched with pistols that none shall issue forth. <laughs> what shall I do? I'll creep up into the chimney. Oh, there they always used to discharge their burning pieces. Creep into the kiln hole. Seek there, on my word. Either chest, copper, well vault, press trunk, the rough shaft the remembrance of such places, and ask goes to them by his note. There's no hiding you in the house. I'll go out then. If you go out in your own semblance, you die, Sir John. Unless, unless you go out disguised. How might we disguise him? <laughs> Alas, the day I know not. There's no woman's gown big enough to fit him, otherwise he might have put on a hat, coat, and muffler and escape. Good heart! Devise something, any extremity rather than a mischief. <gasps> My maid's aunt, the fat woman of Brentford, has a gown of mom. Go, go, sweet Sir John. <laughs> Mistress Page and I look for some linen for your head. Yes, quick, quick. We'll come dress you straight. Put on the gown the while. And today I will be playing the part of Beatrice in Act 4, Scene 1 from Much Ado About Nothing. Hello, my name is David Hargraves, and I'll be playing Benedict.
Lady Beatrice, have you wept all this while? Yea, and I will weep a while longer. I will not desire that. You have no reason. I do it freely. Well, surely I do believe your fair cousin is wrong. Oh, how much might the man deserve of me that would right her? Is there any way to show such friendship? A very even way, but no such friend. <laughs> May a man do it? It is a man's office, but not yours. Why do you love nothing in the world so well as you? Is not that strange? As strange as the thing I know not. Were it possible for me to say I love nothing so well as you? But believe me not, and yet I lie not. I confess nothing, nor I deny nothing. I am sorry for my cousin. Well, by my sword, Beatrice, thou lovest me. Do not swear and eat it. I will swear by it that you love me, and I will make him eat it that says I love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no sauce that can be devised against it, I protest I love thee. Why then, God forgive me. What offense, sweet Beatrice. You have stayed me in a happy hour. I was about to protest I loved you. And do it with all thy heart. I love you with so much of my heart, there is none left to protest. Well, come, bid me do anything for thee. Kill Claudio. Not for the wide world. You kill me to deny it. Farewell. Well, tarry, sweet Beatrice. I am gone, though I am here. <laughs> there is no love in you, nay, I pray you let me go. But Beatrice! In faith, I will go. Well, we'll be friends first. You dare easier be friends with me than fight with mine enemy? Is Claudio thine enemy? Is it not approved in the height of villain that hath wronged, slandered, dishonored my kinswoman? Oh, that I were a man. What, to bear her in hands until they come to take hand, and then, with public accusation, uncovered slander, unmitigated rancor. Oh, God, that I were a man! I would eat his heart in the marketplace! Hear me, Beatrice! Drunk with a man out at a window! A proper saying! Nay, but Beatrice! Sweet hero, she is wrong, she is slandered, she is undone! Beatrice! Princess and county! Surely a princely testimony, a goodly count. Count Comfect, a sweet gallant, surely. Oh, that I were a man for his sake. Or that I had any friend who would be a man for my sake. But manhood is melted into compliment, valor into courtesies, and men are only turned into tongue, and trim ones too. He is now as valiant as Hercules that only tells a lie and swears it. I cannot be a man with wishing, therefore I will die a woman with grieving. Terry, good Beatrice, by this hand I love thee. Use it for my love some other way than swearing by it. Think you, in your soul, the Count Claudio hath wronged, hero? Yea, as sure as I have a thought or a soul. Enough, I am engaged. I will challenge him. I will kiss your hand, and so I leave you. As you hear of me, so think of me. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. Now go. Comfort your cousin, for I must say she is dead, and so farewell. My name is Robbie Mountlight, and I'll be portraying Maria. Hi, my name is Wendell Slade, and I'll be portraying Malvolio. And we'll be portraying Act 3, Scene 4 of Twelfth Night. I've sent after him. He says he'll come. 
How shall I feast him? What bestow of him? For youth is bought more oft than begged or borrowed. I speak too loud. Where's Malvolio? He is sad and civil and suits well for a servant with my fortunes. Where's Malvolio? He's coming, madame, but in a very strange manner. He is sure possessed, madame. Why? What's the matter? Does he rave? No, madame. He doesn't even smile. Your ladyship best have some guard about you, if he come, for sure. The man's tainted in his wits. Go, come hither. I am as mad as he. Sad and merry madness, equal be. <laughs> How now? Malvolio? Sweet lady, hold, oh, oh. hold. Smilest thou. I sent for thee upon a sad occasion. Sad, lady? I could be sad. This does make some obstruction in the blood, this cross guard ring. But what of that? If it please the eye of one, it is with me as the very true son it is. Please one. How dost thou, man? What is the matter with thee? Not black in my mind, though yellow in my legs. <laughs> it came to his hands, and command shall be executed. I think we do know the sweet Roman hand. Wilt thou go to bed, Malvolio? To bed? Hey, sweetheart, and I'll come to thee. <laughs> God, comfort thee. Why dost thou smile so and... Kiss my hand so often. How do you, Malvolio? <laughs> At your request. <laughs> yes, Nightingales. Answer, dogs. Why appear you with this ridiculous boldness before my lady? Be not afraid of greatness. Twas well great. What meanest thou by that, Malvolio? Some are born great. Huh? Some achieve greatness. What sayest thou? And some have greatness thrust upon them. Heaven restore thee! Remember who commended thy yellow stockings. <laughs> thy yellow stockings? And wish to see thee cross gartered. Cross gartered? Go to thou art made if thou desirest to be so. Am I made? If not, let me see thee a servant still. Why, this is very midsummer madness. Madame, the young gentleman of the Count Orsino's is returned. I can hardly entreat him back. He attends your ladyship's pleasure. I'll come to him. Good Maria. Let this fellow be looked to. Where's my cousin Toby? Let some of my people have a special care of him. I would not have him miscarry for the half of my dowry. <laughs> Hello, this is Act 3, Scene 1 of The Two Gentlemen of Verona. We are from Hampton High School. My name is Kai Suyama, and I will be portraying Lance. And I am Andrew Cayley, portraying Speed. In Primus, she can fetch and carry. Why, a horse could do no more. Nay, a horse cannot fetch. But only carry. <laughs> Therefore is she better than a jade. Item. She can milk. Look you. A sweet virtue and a maid with clean hands. Oh, oh no! Signorance! What news of your mastership? With my mastership? Why, it is at sea. <laughs> well, your whole vice still. Mistake the word. What news, then, in thy paper? 
The blackest news that ever thou heardest. Why, man? How black? Why as black as ink? Uh, let me read them. Fie on thee, Joltad. <laughs> thou canst not read. Thou liest. I can. <laughs> I will try thee. Tell me this. Who begot thee? Meryl, the son of my grandmother? <laughs> oh, illiterate loiterer! It was the son of thy grandmother. This proves that thou canst not read. Come, fool, come. Try me in thy favor. There. And St. Nicholas be thy speed. Ah, in primus she can milk. Hey, that she can. Item, she brews good ale. And there up comes the proverb, blessing of your heart, you brew good ale. <laughs> Item, she can knit. What need a man care for a stock with a wench when she can knit him a stock? Item, she can wash and scour. A special virtue, for then she would need not to be washed and scoured. <laughs> Item, she can spin. Then may I set the world on wheels when she can spin for her living. Item, she hath many... Nameless virtue. Well, that's as much as to say bastard virtues that indeed know not their fathers and therefore have no names. Ah, here follow her vices. Close at the heels of her virtues. I don't. She's not to be kissed in fasting due to the respect of her breath. Well, that fault may be mended with a breakfast read on. Item, she hath a sweet mouth. That makes amends for her sour breath. <laughs> Item, she is. Slow in words. <laughs> oh, villain, that set that down among her vices. To be slow in words is a woman's only virtue. <laughs> I pray thee, out with it, and place it for her chief virtue. I don't know. She is proud. Out with that, too. It was Eve's legacy and cannot be taken from her. I don't know. She hath no teeth. I care not for that neither, for I love crust. Item, she is cursed. Well, the best is, she hath no teeth to bite. <laughs> Item, she is too liberal. Of her tongue she cannot, for that's writ down that she is slow of. Of her purse she shall not, for that I'll keep shut. Now, of another thing she may, and uh, that cannot I help. <laughs> Item. She hath more hairs than wit, more faults than hairs, and more wealth than faults. Stop there. I will have her. She was mine, and not mine twice or thrice in that last article. Rehearse it once more. <clears throat> she hath more hairs than wit. More hairs than wit? Well, it may be. I'll prove it. The cover of the salt hides the salt, and therefore it is more than the salt. The hair that covers the wit is more than the wit, for the greater hides the less. What's next? And more faults than hair. That's monstrous! Oh, that that were out! And more wealth than faults. Well, that word makes the faults gracious. Well, I'll have her, and if it be a match, as nothing is impossible. What then? Why? Then will I tell thee that thy master stays for thee at the north gate. For me? For thee? Hey, who art thou? He hath stayed for a better man than thee. And I <laughs> must go to him. Well, thou must run to him. For thou hath stayed so long that going will scarce serve the turn. Why didst not tell me sooner? Pox of your love letters. <sighs> now leave me swing for reading my letter. An unmannerly slave that will thrust himself into secrets. How after to rejoice in the boy's correction. Abigail Gilman, and I'm from Steubenville High School. 
This is the Jailer's Daughter from Two Noble Kinsmen, Act Two, Scene Six. such prisoners and such daughters, and shortly you may keep yourself now to him. Hi, my name is Chimere Cogdale Freeman from Pittsburgh Kappa, and I will be portraying Othello from Othello, Act 5, Scene 2. Thank you. Behold, I have a weapon. A better never did itself sustain upon a soldier's thigh. I've seen the day that with this little arm and this good sword, I've made my way through more impediments than 20 times you've stopped. But O vain boast, who can control his fate? Tis not so now. Be not afraid, though you see me weapon. Here's my journey's end. Here's my butt and every sea mark of my utmost sail. Do you go back this maid? Tis a lost fear, man, but a rush against Othello's breast, and he retires. Where should Othello go? Oh, ill starred wrench, pell is thy smock. And when we shall meet and comp, this look of thine will hurl my soul from heaven, and fiends will snatch it. Cold, cold, my girl, even like thy Cassidy. Oh, cursed slave, with me, ye devils, from the, from the possession of this heavenly sight. Blow me about in winds, roast me in sulfur, wash me in steep down gulfs of liquid fire. Oh, Desdemona, Desdemona, dead. Oh, oh, oh. 
Thank you. Hello, my name is Cameron Tino, and I will be playing King Richard from Richard II, Act 3, Scene 2. No matter where, of comfort no man speak. Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. Make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let's choose executors and talk of wills. And uh, yet not so. For what can we bequeath save our deposed bodies to the ground? Our lands, our lives, and all our bowling brokes, and nothing can we call our own but death. And that small model of the barren earth which serves as paste and cover to our bones. For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed. Some poisoned by their wives. Some sleeping killed. All murdered. For within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court. And there the antic sits, scoffing his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks, infusing him with self and vain conceit as if this flesh which woes about our life were brass, impregnable. <laughs> and humor thus comes at the last, and with a little pen bores through his castle wall, and farewell, king! Cover your heads, and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form, a ceremonious duty. For you have mistook me all this while. I live with bread, like you, fill want. Taste grief, need friends, subjected thus. How can you say to me, I am a king? Thank you. Man's life is 
tedious one. I have tired myself and for two nights together have made the ground my bed. I should be sick, but that my resolution helps me. Ill heard when from the mountaintop Bassanio showed thee, thou walkst within a ken. Though Jove, I think, foundations fly the wretched, such, I mean, where they should be relieved. on them, knowing tis a punishment for trial? Yes, no wonder when rich ones scarce tell truth. To lapse in fullness is sore than to lie for weed, and falsehood is worse in kings than beggars. My dear lord, thou art one of the false ones. Now I think on thee. My hunger's gone, but even before I was at point to seek for food. Tis some savage hold. I would best not to call. I dare not call. Yet I am in her cleated where throw nature makes it valiant. Plenty and peace breeds cowards. Hardness ever of hardiness is mother. Oh! Who's here? If anything that's civil, speak. If savage, take. Or lend! <laughs> oh, what? No answer? Then I'll enter. Best draw my sword. And if mine enemy but fear the sword like me, he'll scarcely look on it. Such a foe, good heavens. Thank you. killed him. From forth the kennel of thy womb hath crept a hellhound that doth hunt us all to death. That dog that had his teeth before his eyes to oh, worry lambs and lap their gentle blood. That excellent grand tyrant of the earth that rings in gallant eyes of weeping souls that foul the facer of God's handiwork. Thy womb at least chase us to our graves. Oh, upright, just, and true disposing God, how do I thank thee that this carnal cur preys on the issue of his mother's body and makes her few fellows with others moan? Bear with me. I'm hungry for revenge, and now I cloy me with beholding it. Thy Edward, he is dead. That killed my Edward, and thy other Edward, dead. To quit my Edward. Young York, he is but boot, because both they matched not the high perfection of my loss. Thy Clarence, he is dead. That stabbed my Edward. And the beholders of this frantic play, thy adulterate Hastings, rivers bond grave, and 
happily smothered in their dusky graves. Richard yet lives. Hell's black intelligencer. Only reserve their factor to buy souls and send them thither. But at hand, at hand ensues his piteous and unpity end. Earth gapes, hell burns, fiends roar and saints pray to have him suddenly convey from hence. Oh, cancel his bond of life, dear God, I pray, that I may live to say the dog is dead. Betraying Malvolio from Act Two, Scene Five from Twelfth Night. Not the former, and yet to crush this a little. All of these letters are in my name. Soft, he follows, prose. If this fall in thy hand, revolve. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In my stars, I am above thee. <laughs> but be not afraid of greatness, for some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness uh, thrust upon them. Open their hands and let thy blood and spirit embrace them. If <laughs> be opposite of a kinsman, surely with servants, and let thy tongue tang arguments of state, and put thyself into a trick of singularity. She that thus advises thee, that uh, oh, that's I for thee. Remember who commended thy yellow stockings and wished to see the Evercross guarded. I say, remember. Go to, thou art made of thou desirest to be so. <laughs> the fortune unhappy. Daylight and champion discovers not more. This is open. I will read politic authors. <laughs> I will baffle Sir Toby. I will wash off gross acquaintance, and I will point device the very man I do not now fool myself to let imagination jade me, for every reason excites to this. The mamelie belly, mamelie belly. <laughs> she did commend my yellow stockings of late. She did appraise my leg being cross guarded with a kind of injunction, e'en with the swiftness of putting on. Ah, oh, don't I make thee! I will smile, and I will do everything that thou wilt have me. <laughs>
could tell that you were having an amazing time, and I could tell that there was this moment where you all sort of took center stage and you took it in. That's what it's about, is taking your moment and enjoying it. It doesn't matter who wins because you've already won. You did it. You learned Shakespeare. You got up in front of all of these people and you made magic happen. And that's what it's about. I always say to my students, and I have a couple of them here today, so maybe they'll know the answer. I always say to them, leap, and the net will appear. You have tackled Shakespeare, and everything else in front of you is going to be easy. Really. So leap. Whether it's taking center stage, or the next thing you try, leap. You all did such a beautiful job tonight, so I just want to thank you again. You filled my heart. Can we give them another round of applause? Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna say is, um, why do we do this contest every year? Why do teachers, educators, parents, coaches do it? Why does public theater do it? Because theater is magic, right? Theater is magic. It inspires. It changes. So remember that. Encourage your family and your friends, all of you, come back to live theater. Okay? And support your young artists. Support each other. It's so important. Which is my segue to our award winner for this year. Um, it's another woman. Hooray. Yay, women. Um, and she is the founder and executive director of Dragon's Den, which is an after-school arts education. Can we give a big round of applause to this year's Rob Sellers Award winner, Excellence in Arts Education, Julia Petrucci. <laughs> Italian, we 
don't pay that many compliments, so I'm sure he's shocked there. <laughs> so this is completely unprepared. So, um, one of the reasons that I, I would like to share with all of you, besides my love for Bill, one of the reasons why I came to this country, and particularly to Pittsburgh, because I think it's one of the most wonderful towns I've ever seen in my life. You are very lucky to be born and raised in this town. And you have to trust me because I've traveled extensively. But what we have here in this town, here with the Shakespeare Model Contest, with this art, with these uh, opportunities, it's something that each of you need really to appreciate. It's something that it is special. Now, why am I here? Um, I am the founder and the executive director of Dragon's Den. And what is Dragon's Den? It's a youth development center in Homestead. Um, it's how, so let me explain what it is. It's, uh, it operates inside the old St. Mary Magdalene in Homestead. That church was closed for more than 10 years, and we decided to open it back to the community of Homestead. And uh, how did we do that? We did that in a unique way. We built inside the church a historic building, a rope course, two-level rope course, a climbing wall, and obviously a stage. So let me tell you why. When my husband and I got married, we were so happy, so full of joy, and we just wanted to share this joy with as many people as possible. So we realized we didn't want to have like wedding gifts, gifts, we didn't need any of it. So we decided that instead, we would just raise funds for a mission in Patagonia. Patagonia is in Argentina. And we raised almost $19,000 that we had to bring cash all around our waist. That was quite an adventure. <laughs> so we arrived in the mission. The mission was dedicated to children. The little town was called, is called, Comodoro Rivadavia. We lived in the mission for three weeks with an incredible person, Padre Gordi. And I know he's there uh, looking down at us. So living with him, we learned many things. But there is one thing that I wanted to share with all of you because it's one lesson I never forgot. So imagine for a moment, Comodoro Rivadavia is a place that it's extremely poor. And when you talk about poor, I'm saying real poor, like mountain of garbage. Kids that live in the garbage. Dogs everywhere. And the wind constantly blowing. So you, you cannot plant anything. The dirt is so dry. But, there was a mission, there was a school, there was Padre Gordi, one person, one person that from Italy decided to go to Commodore Rivadavia and give hope. He built this school with a lot of volunteers and when we visited, I was shocked. I entered the school and it's perfectly clean. It's perfectly organized, but what was more surprising were the bathrooms. Oh. We wouldn't expect that, right? Well, I'm telling you, the bathrooms were the most beautiful bathrooms I had ever seen. Granite, beautiful Italian porcelain, and I couldn't understand. So, one, one typical trait of Italian, we are very direct. So I just asked him and I said, why did you spend so much money in the bathroom? So, <laughs> right? And the priest said, because what we do here, we 
create dreams. We need to create dreams for these children, dreams that go beyond what they live and what they see. Just once we teach the children to dream, we can ask children to work hard towards those dreams. So that lesson is the heart, the heart of Dragon's Den. At the Dragon's Den in Homestead, we want to create dreams for our children. And what is the best way to dream? Right here, on a stage. So when my children were involved uh, for the first time, thanks to Hope Academy, through Shakespeare Model Competition, and I found out about this incredible program, I said, absolutely, we need to bring it to Homestead. We need the children of Homestead, West Homestead, to dream. And Shakespeare is so relevant to young people. And while it is relevant, it talks about things that are remote enough so the children can discuss it, can share their uh, feelings about that, that they can talk about these characters that portray human nature. And I love that. And uh, every year I am so surprised to see what she, Shakespeare can bring to our children. Last year one of our kids I got honorable mention and he said, you know what that means? And I said, no. And he said, next year I'm going to be there. And guess what? He is here tonight. So <laughs> I am very, very proud. for a moment to think about one time when you said something important to somebody else that needed to hear that advice. Take a moment and think about that. And after that, please stand up. and give yourself a round of applause. We are all in the universe here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody. I'm very happy. Ooh, what is this water coming out of my eyes? Oh my goodness! We have another round of applause for our Rob Zoe Wonderful. Um, so now we're going to take a little bit of a breather. Uh, I'm going to go check on the judges, <laughs> make sure that the green room is still in one piece. Um, and this is uh, time for you to stretch out again, um, for you to do a quick drink or use the restroom. Um, and when we come back, uh, we will announce the winners of the 2022 Shakespeare Monologue and Scene Contest. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. All right, how's everyone feeling? Yay! Excited? Oh. oh my gosh, we have seen such amazing, amazing performances on this stage tonight. Can we have one more huge round of applause for you? Incredible, tremendous, and as it's been said many times, you all have already won. Uh, but to follow tradition, we do have uh, the winners for tonight, and we are going to be announcing them uh, in a moment. I just want to say I'm going to be inviting winners up to this. I'm like, how much more can I build this uh, up to the stage? And I just want to remind folks that the prizes for tonight um, are $250 to that student school. Um, and also a copy of the Ardent Edition of the Complete Works of Shakespeare. Um, and now to present 
the winners, I'm going to invite Mariah C. Kaminsky, Shaman McHugh, Jamie Ackerman, and Mariah Yet tonight. Can we have one more round for Mr. Parag? Um, thank you, thank you, thank you all. Um, we could have awarded this over and over and over again, but we have uh, selected some first place winners. Uh, for the lower division scenes, uh, we'd like to congratulate Swickley Academies of Midsummer Night's Dream. Congratulations again to all of our finalists and winners. Thank you.